Hello, my name is Fran Stoddard, and today's event on regional cooperation is offered jointly by the Orton Family Foundation and the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts. For this webinar, we have four terrific speakers who will help us understand how towns can support each other, pool resources, and cooperate across town boundaries to gain efficiencies and improve quality of life in small cities and towns. Joining us today are Brett Schwartz of the National Association of Development Organizations that probably most of you know better as NATO. He is at the Research Foundation there. Hi, Brett. Welcome. Hey, Fred. How are you doing? Great. We also have Sarah Lucas of Networks Northwest in Northwest Michigan. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. And Laura Meadows is with us. She is the Executive Director of the Kentucky Arts Council. Hi, Lori. Hi. Glad to be here. Okay. And we have Susan uh, to plus CCs. Do plus C. Do plus C. Oh, should have practiced. Run, Thank you, run, Susan. Two plus three. Okay. <laughs> Thank two you. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> She's the program director of the South Carolina Arts Commission. First, I'm going to cover a few quick logistics. Each guest will then offer brief five to seven minute presentations. And after that, we'll have an interactive uh, time of questions from all of you participants. Because we have nearly 235 registrants for our webinar today from 45 states and four countries, we'll also be muting our listeners to get as clean an audio signal as possible. Be sure you check you click on the Adobe Connect platform link that came with your email to follow along with the presenter's visuals and to enter your questions. Many of you have already sent in questions, and we thank you for that. Our speakers have reviewed them, and many will be answered during the initial presentations. We will also be um, uh, have the opportunity to – you will have the opportunity to ask questions during and after the presentations in a Q&A box that's right there on the Adobe Connect platform screen. If you have any technical problems, you can – Dial star zero for phone issues or email Caitlin Davison at cdavison at orton.org, which is on your screen. But please use the Q&A box for any content questions for our guests. Thank you very much, and let's get on with the webinar. So Brett Schwartz serves as the program manager at the NATO Research Foundation, managing capacity building programs for rural communities and small towns. His work covers topics including economic diversification strategies, asset-based economic development, and community engagement. Many of his programs are aimed at cross-border co cooperation, including training, research, and peer networking services in the areas of economic and disaster resilience, transportation, and sustainability, sustainable community development. Brett is a, also a graduate of the University of Baltimore School of Law, where he focused on land use issues. Welcome, Brett, and uh, take it away with your presentation. It's so great to have you here. Go ahead. Excellent. Thanks, Fran. Thanks so much, and hello to all of you listening in. Uh, you know, it's a real honor to, to join you all today, especially knowing how many of you are, are tuned in. Um, first, I want to give a special uh, thank you to Caitlin Davison at Orton uh, for inviting me to participate. You know, as Frank said, I'm uh, Brett Schwartz with the National Association of Development Organizations, and we are a, a membership association of regional planning commissions and councils of government uh, that serve primarily uh, small metropolitan and rural regions. And I'll talk a bit more about our work later on and uh, what types of resources that we provide. Um, but I think my role on today's webinar is, is really that of the opening act in some ways for, for Sarah, Lori, and Susan. Uh, who will share some really powerful examples of uh, regional collaboration uh, happening on the grounds uh, in their communities. So I want to help kind of frame those presentations uh, by giving an overview uh, of what we mean by regionalism and, and why it's so important, especially in, in rural places. Uh, so with that, let's, uh, let's jump into the presentation. Perfect. So first, you know, a definition of, of regionalism. And I've taken this one uh, from one of my mentors uh, in the field of regional development, Steve Etcher. And uh, Steve is a former executive director of the Boone's Lake Regional Planning Commission located in Warrington, Missouri. And Steve has said that regionalism is a committed effort to improve communities through increased coordination and collaboration, maximizing efficiency through united approaches while preserving individual aspirations. And so at the heart of regional cooperation is, is really striking that delicate balance of, of united approaches and individual aspirations. And this, of course, is, is no easy feat, uh, particularly in rural America. 
Um, as you know, small towns compete for businesses, for residents, tourists, and, and limited funding. You know, and that doesn't even, you know, cover town rivalries, you know, that are often sparked by high school sports, uh, you know, in many parts of the country. So in many places, small towns may operate as little islands unto themselves, you know, fighting for resources and recognition, and competition is the norm. Um, but for those of you who work in, in regional planning and economic development, you know, arts, culture, tourism, or, or natural resource protection, you know that working across jurisdictional lines, you know, breaking down those barriers uh, is critical to, to meeting your goals. So here are just a few examples of, of why it's so important to think regionally in, in rural places. And I don't have time to dive too deep into any of these, but I hope all of these reasons resonate with you and make the case for working collaboratively across town and, and county borders. You know, economies, natural landscapes, and then, you know, yes, their natural disasters are often regional in nature and require an all-hands-on-deck approach, uh, particularly in rural places where resources and, and support may be limited. So regionalism is, is complex, it's often messy, and, and takes time and dedication to nurture. And there's definitely no silver bullet uh, for getting communities, uh, governments, and organizations to think regionally. Um, but here are what I think are kind of three key ingredients uh, for making that happen. And, you know, first you need local and, and regional champions uh, supporting your project and vision. And champions are those people who are fully invested in seeing your project through to fruition and are willing to contribute, um, whether financial resources or technical know-how, their social connections, or, or, or even their time. And, you know, look outside the box for those champions. And, and they might not be the people that show up, you know, to town hall meetings or zoning hearings, but they still care about the future of their community. So find out who they are and go do that. Next, you need, you know, strong institutions and governance uh, where collaboration is respected and encouraged. And, you know, governments, of course, look very different in, in every part of your region. And I know we have an international audience as well. Um, but, you know, places with effective functioning institutions, municipalities, and, and really engaged elected officials uh, can make all the difference in forming those cross-cutting partnerships uh, with the public and private sectors. And then finally, you need to, you know, foster a culture of trust and openness. And this means communities and their partners are willing to share ideas and information, reach out, and most importantly, not worry about who is taking credit for the success. You know, regionalism cannot thrive uh, if towns do not trust each other or are suspicious uh, of each other's motives. So I also wanted to note that, you know, supporting regionalism is also an effective strategy in fostering resilient communities. And we've embraced a really broad and inclusive definition of resilience, um, and that being the ability of a region or a community to anticipate, withstand, or bounce back from any type of shock or disruption. And this can include natural disasters, hazards, you know, the impacts of climate change, but also those man-made economic shocks, uh, such as the closure of a large employer, uh, the decline of an important industry, and, and changes in the workforce and population shifts. Uh, that many of you may be experiencing in your own communities. So while preparing for these impacts are important in all regions and communities of all sizes, you know, rural and smaller places are particularly vulnerable uh, given their size, geography, and resources. So next I just want to give you know, a quick background about my organization and some of the services we have available to support your own regional work. Uh, so NATO is a membership association of the country's 500 innovations, or RDOs. And RDOs might be called different things uh, in your region, uh, such as councils of government, uh, economic development districts, regional planning commissions, or, or some other name. Um, but you know, no matter what these entities are called, they're all multi-jurisdictional planning and development agencies that work at the regional level uh, to improve local governments and communities by promoting economic and community development. So the majority of our membership serve uh, communities just like yours, you know, small metropolitan and rural regions. Uh, where our RDOs are particularly important to provide technical assistance and general support uh, with planning, uh, GIS mapping, business and economic development strategies, and other guidance uh, to small communities and towns that may not have the expertise uh, to do so on their own. So I really encourage you to, to reach out and engage with your local regional development organization if you haven't done so already. Um, if you're unsure which RDO serves your region, please reach out to me afterwards, and I'd certainly be happy uh, to connect you. Now, I'm a program manager with the, the NATO Research Foundation, which is a nonprofit research affiliate of NATO, and we work on a variety of projects related to issues impacting small metros and rural places and, and study and promote regional solutions through our research and training and peer exchanges and, and publications. So you can see some of the issue areas up on the screen uh, that we work on, as, as well as some of our uh, publications and, and images from trainings and workshops we host uh, throughout the country. So. 
All of our publications, webinars, and resources are archived for free on our website at um, www.nato.org. So I hope you can, can check those out. And I also wanted to point out that last month we recognized 96 uh, transformative projects from all across the country uh, through our annual Innovation Awards program. And I really encourage you to, to check out a story map, which you can see a screenshot up there, uh, which we designed in partnership with Esri, uh, which really highlights the stories behind uh, each of these 96 projects, um, which cover a whole host of areas such as regional planning, um, economic development, uh, transportation, uh, workforce, community health, and a host of others. Um, Networks Northwest in Michigan uh, received an award for their US 131 quarter planning work. Uh, so really excited uh, that Sarah will be speaking right after me and really tell you the story uh, behind that amazing project uh, in just a few minutes. So, um, yeah, you know, as I wrap things up, I just wanted to, to kind of share this quote from a book uh, that I read a few years back. And this book's actually this quote is really talking about kind of personal time management and goal setting. Uh, but I feel it really captures the spirit of all, all the work that we do. And, you know, that is that planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. And I think this is particularly true in, in rural regions and smaller towns uh, that are facing powerful external and internal changes uh, that are reshaping their communities uh, in both positive and negative ways. So I think this forward thinking, this collaborative regional planning process, you know, really allows residents to envision and create their own future uh, rather than have that future be determined solely by outside economic forces uh, beyond their control. So that's it for me. Again, just, just the warm-up act here, um, but I hope I provided a good frame uh, for the three uh, excellent case studies uh, that you're about to hear shortly. Um, so please be in touch afterwards if you have any questions about NATO or our work um, or our membership. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it back to Fran, and thanks again for tuning in. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Brett. Thanks for that uh, quote, well, a couple of good quotes and for those resources and, and the, the big picture idea of, of regionalism and how we can support each other. Um, and Sarah Lucas, who, as you said, uh, was uh, her organization was awarded one of your innovation um, awards, which is awesome. So Sarah Lucas is with us. She has been a practicing planner in Northwest Michigan for 15 years. She is currently the regional planning department manager of Networks Northwest, where she works closely with local governments, nonprofits, and other community stakeholders in the 10-county Northwest Michigan region on a variety of community issues, including housing and economic development strategies and implementation. She also coordinates and facilitates public outreach strategies and conducts in-depth community research and analysis. The work of Networks Northwest has been noted for its placemaking innovations, as we have mentioned. Welcome, Sarah, and go ahead. Okay, thank you, Fran. Thanks for having me here today. I'm uh, really happy to be here and have the chance to talk with so many other communities that are working through some of the same issues that we are in our region. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Brett for that great introduction. There was um, a lot of uh, information there that I, I couldn't couldn't say it better myself in terms of what regionalism means and um, how you actually implement some of those those great ideas. So um, thanks again for having me here. And um, I'm, uh, as Fran said, um, with Networks Northwest. It's a region in Northwest Michigan, um, the Northwest Lower Peninsula, I should say. Uh, I have a little map here that shows um, where we are geographically. Um, if you're not familiar with our region, um, you can see our western boundary. Um, that's all Lake Michigan shoreline. Um, so we have a, a pretty big area that's um, uh, diverse in terms of um, our shoreline communities and our inland areas, but we're all rural. Our entire region is rural. Our, our biggest community is 15,000 people, and that's 15,000. <laughs> um, so a lot of small towns um, that are dealing with some of the issues that Brett mentioned in terms of um, limited capacity and limited resources, and so they really look to Networks Northwest to kind of fill in some of the gaps in capacity and resources. We um, started working with a number of communities um, in our in the inland portion of our region. We're starting to make that distinction between shoreline and inland communities um, that are dealing with a um, pretty common set of issues. Again, many of them that I alluded to, some disinvestment, um, a history of um, uh, in industrial activity that's um, kind of changing with the with a new economy, and they're struggling with lower incomes and um, are are really trying to um, put themselves in a better place. And we uh, 
have kind of initiated this regional planning effort called the Framework for Growth and Investment along US 131. It covers six communities. Um, it's a pretty long corridor. It's outlined here on the map in green. It goes from Cadillac at the south border of our region up to Petoskey, which is uh, along the Lake Michigan shoreline. It started with the uh, um, Michigan Regional Prosperity Initiative and uh, the HUD Sustainable Communities Program. With funding from both, both of those initiatives, we, we put together a framework for a, a framework for our future plan, which um, kind of details some of the economic development um, needs and opportunities in our region. And uh, one of the um, key implementation activities of that economic development plan or um, regional growth plan was to address some of the disinvestment and um, other economic development needs along the U.S. 131 corridor. The Michigan Regional Prosperity Initiative, to back up a little bit, is um, something that's unique to Michigan. It's a really great program that we've um, had over the last few years that incentivizes communities to work together as regions and provides some funding for regions to um, help communities achieve um, bigger goals. Um, so through that program, we're able to provide some funding to communities for placemaking type projects, planning projects, and in this case, to do a regional economic development plan for the 131 corridor. So with that funding um, and that support, we started uh, the Framework for Growth and Investment on 131 process in um, spring and summer 2015. And we kind of kicked it off with, um, uh, I guess I'd call it a meet and greet. Um, it, <laughs> technically, we've been calling them leadership summits, um, but they're uh, basically convenings of all of the community leaders along the US 131 corridor. And our first meeting was uh, really interesting. We had a really great turnout of all of, um, you know, the, the city council members and the uh, village council members and county board members from all of these um, kind of far-flung communities. And we brought them together with a lot of representatives from the state to talk about what programs are available um, to these communities um, uh, from the state. And uh, we also wanted to kind of get people to start talking to each other at that first leadership summit meeting about what they had in common and what they were looking forward to and um, what they were, were struggling to address. And initially there was a lot of uh, suspicion and resistance to working together. After that first meeting, though, I think that um, <laughs> it was kind of funny. I think one of the first um, commonalities that people discovered was kind of their frustrations with the state. <laughs> um, and I think that actually, um, we followed up that first meeting with a second leadership summit that asked people to um, sit down and talk in a lot of detail about what they were uh, hoping to address. And um, I think they were all really surprised at how much they had in common and couldn't believe that they hadn't met each other before and that they hadn't been working on some of these issues together in the past. And so it was a real eye-opener for everyone in the room. And there was a lot of excitement about the potential for what they could do if they combined resources and started working together. A few of the things that came out of that meeting, and I'll talk about them more in the next few slides, but um, uh, trails and um, public land are really big assets for all of these communities, and they really saw that as, a, as a, an opportunity that they could leverage if they were willing to work together. Um, so that was something that came out of that first meeting and kind of united people around um, regionalism and um, uh, sort of pushed the initiative forward. Um, so those leadership summits uh, started last year. They're still going on, um, and we continue to have just great turnouts and great discussions with all of the people that, that come. Um, it's a real learning experience for everyone who shows up in that room. Um, but they have actually uh, created um, a, a few documents. Um, <laughs> we have, of course, the, the overall um, regional plan, the Framework for Growth and Investment on US 131, but as part of this project, we also created a couple community-specific plans um, for two communities, Kalkaska and Mantelona, both created an economic development plan. And both of those communities also, um, with um, assistance from a marketing consultant, um, created a target industry market analysis. But like I mentioned earlier, they have a lot of industrial disinvestment, and they're trying to um, find um, 
find ways to attract new investment to those um, underused properties. So they did a, a market analysis to help them in that work. Uh, so quite a, quite a few documents and a lot of things to think about um, came out of that process. Um, a few of the things, and I alluded to a couple of them, that uh, people were, were really motivated to talk about together and work on together, um, the, in, the industrial history that all of them are, are dealing with and, and trying to promote, actually. They, they recognize that in a very tourist-oriented economy like we have in Northwest Michigan, their communities provide a, a, a pretty unique niche in terms of um, in, industrial opportunities. Um, they know that um, because of their access to transportation corridors and, um, you know, some of the industrial properties that they already have and industrial activity that they already have going on in their communities, they know that they're well positioned to attract more more business. Um, so they have um, uh, those linkages. A lot of uh, infrastructure is located along that corridor. Um, US-131 is a pretty highly traveled corridor in, in Michigan and connects northern Michigan with the southern part of the state and um, Indiana, so Indiana and Illinois. So it's um, definitely uh, a key key asset for attracting business, and they're trying to figure out how to um, best leverage that. There's uh, sewer and water infrastructure and natural gas, and those are not givens in our region. Um, not every community has those, so they know that they're in a good spot that they're able to offer those. They also have historic downtowns. A lot of them have seen, um, you know, some hard times, and they're trying to figure out how to fill vacancies and bring people back into town when the trend has been to move out into the country. Um, so there's uh, quite a few, um, quite a few uh, commonalities there. A lot of lower incomes associated with the um, uh, loss of industry. Um, but as I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of recreation assets that um, haven't really been leveraged, and they're really looking for ways to kind of bring those to the forefront and um, build some economic opportunities and address some of the negative perceptions that are out there um, that are related to the lower incomes and loss of industry in those communities. I won't go through the strategies in a lot of detail. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of your communities have considered similar strategies, but just to give you an idea of um, some of the big ones they're talking about, are becoming development ready and making it easier for businesses to uh, relocate in, in their towns through zoning and through incentives. Um, they're looking closely at placemaking initiatives to try to increase the, or improve the quality of life locally and, again, enhancing those recreation assets um, that have, have really been kind of um, uh, yeah, underused. Um, and, and finally, and I think this is the, one of the things that really got everyone excited about working together, is considering how they can better market and promote their communities as a region. And that's a really important um, effort that I'll explain a little bit uh, more about. Um, one of the uh, first leadership summits that we had uh, that this issue came up that, you know, people tend to, there's a certain image associated with a lot of the communities along 131 that they're lower income, that there's nothing going on there. And we all know when we're familiar with these communities that um, they have all of these incredible assets, great schools, lots of opportunity for business, lots of trails, lots of public land. And how do we get that message out there and address some of the negative images that are out there? So there was a lot of interest in how they could um, better promote their communities. They've created a... Um, uh, a committee that they're calling it Destination 131 North, and they're really actively pursuing marketing strategies and plans at the same time as they're building trail connectivity and working together with neighboring communities to um, create create a, a region of, of trails, I guess you could call it. That's, that's really kind of their economic development priority number one, is to put themselves on the map as a trail destination. At the same time, I mentioned uh, interest in becoming development ready, and a couple of our communities are, are really going great guns on uh, creating master plans that will take them to the next level in terms of um, uh, prioritizing development and redevelopment. And I think um, we're out of time. I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you have um, after we get through all of the slides. But thanks again for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this exciting project with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I, I love how people who kind of mistrusted each other came together, and it sounds like they're doing a lot of 
fantastic work. So thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to uh, great um, ideas that are happening on the ground. Lori Meadows is with us. She is the executive director of the Kentucky Arts Council, where she worked for nearly 20 years. She has worked for nearly 20 years. Prior to her tenure with the Arts Council, she directed the Kentucky Save Outdoor Sculpture and Kentucky Textile Programs. She has served on numerous public art advisory committees, including the Federal Art and Architecture Program and the Smithsonian Institute. Her work has included convening a 54-county Appalachian region to initiate economic growth and development through arts-related tools, resources, and ideas. We are so happy to have her on board. Go ahead, Lori. Okay. Thank you so much, Fran. I'm really glad to be a part of this conversation today. As Fran mentioned, I'm with the Kentucky Arts Council. Um, we are the state arts agency. There's an agency like us in each of the 50 states and the U.S. territories. We're funded by the Kentucky General Assembly and the National Endowment for the Arts. And our mission is to foster environments for the people of Kentucky to value, participate in, and benefit from the arts. And I'm going to talk just a bit about some of the work in which we have been involved. And Brett's presentation certainly validated much of what we've experienced, um, as well as, as Sarah, some of the different things there. We decided to focus on this particular um, work based on the needs identified during public input for our six-year strategic plan and the recommendations that came out of the Creative Industry Report that we released in 2014. And that is a, a, a slide of the cover of, of that report. We investigated ways that we could facilitate bringing people together to learn from each other and to develop networks and partnerships and what kinds of tools and training that we could provide. And the recommendations that are shown here on the right-hand side are those that came out of the reports um, relating to the collaboration, rural development, training, and partnerships. A little bit about uh, information about Kentucky. Um, we have uh, some of the same challenges that Sarah mentioned in Michigan. Kentucky has a total of 120 counties, and the area designated by the Appalachian Regional Commission as part of Appalachia is made up of 54 counties in eastern and southeastern Kentucky, and those are the light blue counties that you see on the map. Kentucky has the worst poverty, poverty rate in Appalachia, with over 25% of the people below the poverty line, and this has been exacerbated by the decline of the coal industry in the region, with a loss of more than 11,000 coal mining jobs over the last eight years. So Kentucky, particularly outside of the metropolitan areas, is very much county-oriented. If you ask someone outside of the larger cities where they're, they're from, they'll use the county name, name instead of the city name. And it's often a struggle to get people to think about working across county lines. So we have specifically focused on the benefits of widening the reach and sharing the, uh, the resources among the various regions outside of specific cities and counties. And um, you'll notice some, uh, some symbols on this, uh, promise zone counties, promise neighborhood counties, homegrown, handmade counties. And I'm going to talk about all of those things um, just a little bit. And uh, there, are, over the past several years, there have been several programs that have been initiated in eastern Kentucky uh, to address issues of poverty, poor health, and lack of education. And we, we really felt that some of our programs and trainings could be of assistance in addressing these issues. And we knew to, that bringing together entities that were perhaps not currently working together would be something that we were equipped to facilitate. One of our first initiatives in this area was the convening for Kentucky Art Place and Our Town Creative Placemaking Grantees. And that convene, those convenings were funded by the Citizens Institute for Rural Design. And through this initial convening, we helped create the Kentucky Creative Commonwealth Network to bring those people together to meet and share resources. And the majority of these grantees were from Eastern Kentucky, and they, along with the uh, grantees from the larger communities of Lexington, Louisville, and Covington, are still working together on projects and initiatives. 
Um, so some of the recent non-arts initiatives in the Appalachian region had specific goals that really resonated with us. And we began by basically inviting ourselves to the table and uh, uh, volunteering our assistance. The SOAR, or Shaping Our Appalachian Region uh, Initiative, was developed by then Kentucky Governor Bashir and Kentucky Congressman Hal Rogers to expand job creation, enhance uh, regional opportunities, innovation, and identity, and improve the quality of life. And then um, the Promise Zone Initiative, which you'll hear more about um, from Susan as well in South Carolina. Uh, Kentucky was the first rural promise zone in the nation, and the purpose is to engage the communities in a collaborative, comprehensive process aimed at improving the overall quality of life in the region. So several issues were identified um, through these initiatives in which the Arts Council felt we could assist, such as providing resources for the development of artists and entrepreneurs, utilizing and building on the existing creative assets in a community, providing statistics on the value of the creative industry, and bringing people from various industries together to work together. We have focused a great deal on business training, um, particularly in the eastern Kentucky area. We've offered Kaufman training, and we have a lot of partners, uh, people that we had not partnered with before, such as the Mountain Association of Community and Economic Development, the Kentucky Highlands Innovation Center. Um, we also developed uh, some Etsy training where we, again, partnered and we provided the only state-sponsored Etsy training in the nation. I don't know if there are any more yet, but we were the first one. But one of the most um, really, I would say overwhelmingly, one of the most sought-after and beneficial things we offer is providing training in conducting community creative asset inventories. And after, you know, being asked several times to provide training, we actually created this inventory guide to help communities create a roadmap of the local arts and culture assets, which they could then use to develop and enhance local development and programming. And our Folk and Traditional Arts Director and our Community Arts and Access Director conduct this training across the state. Um, the categories on the right-hand side are the areas in which the guide is broken out in the training. And a critical part of the process, as well as with a lot of the other work that we do, is uh, to bring people from various sectors and regions together to collaborate and to help everybody under to help people understand that everyone needs to be at the table. Um, one of our success stories that I'd, I'd like to mention today is um, the Heinemann Dulcimer Project in a tiny little community in eastern Kentucky, Heinemann, Kentucky. This um, particular project enhanced the community's sense of identifying uh, of identity by looking at what they had and by using that as a starting point, which was the Kentucky Dulcimer. So the initiative began with a Folk Life uh, Apprenticeship Grant from the Kentucky Arts Council, and it's grown well beyond that into an important initiative that really defines Appalachia's contribution to folk music and to Luthery. And the Dulcimer Project has received to further the work they started the annual Hyman Dulcimer Homecoming, uh, which for the past couple of years has brought luthiers, dulcimer musicians, and other people to Tiny Hindman for the three-day event, and also founded the Museum of the Mountain Dulcimer. There have been over 13 more apprenticeships um, to train people to make the Hindman Dulcimer, and the project received the 2016 Governor's Awards in, in the Arts for Folk Heritage. And... I also want to mention this final project, which is what we are currently um, involved in. This is the Homegrown Handmade Project, which was developed to, uh, designed to develop and implement a pilot project to integrate the arts into farmers' markets. This is something that we've been thinking about for a while, and we were thrilled to receive a $51,000 rural business development grant from USDA to develop the project. It's taking place in Owsley County in eastern Kentucky and Ohio County in west central Kentucky. And we're, uh, we're providing a lot of technical assistance to artists and entrepreneurs, 
on effectively marketing and pricing their work. Artists are also going to be paired with some of the vendors or the farmers uh, market um, exhibitors that uh, so that they can provide assistance in areas that the sellers might need to help showcase their gifts, their goods. So maybe uh, it might be designing labels for products or enhancing signage or making the booths more attractive and then really attracting more buyers to the product and to the farmer's market overall. And finally, we're working with them to add musicians performing at the markets, which will really make it a lot more of an event um, where people will want to spend more time. So, and all of this involves a lot of training. Even though there are only two counties included in the pilot, the end product is going to be a handbook for other communities to use for their farmer's markets and we're inviting people to participate in the training from across the region. So again, it's, it's, um, our work is focusing on collaboration, on working across those um, uh, county borders that often you know, people uh, don't seem to want to work across, and is showing people that you know, every success, no matter how small, is a big success. So, you know, there are lots of small things that, that we're doing, but um, it's really interesting, exciting work, and we're really glad to be a part of it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, so much was there, and I just want to answer a few very quick questions. I think, Lori, it was you that was talking about a training uh, for Etsy, and that's the, um, the website for homemade goods, right? Yes. That's correct, yes. Um, so that's really terrific. It's E-T-S-Y, um, uh, so that is, I'm sure, really helping sell some of those craft items, which is great. Um, right. Also, to back up, uh, there's a question about what kinds of trails in Michigan, and the answer is ATV, bicycle, cross-country, ski. I think there are, I think, um, I'm not sure if that was an answer, or I, I think that might have answered some of those things. Um, and finally, uh, somebody asked about placemaking and really com coming to understand what that is. We will actually be uh, giving you a link at the end of this uh, that you can, you can go to and you'll go very deep into placemaking and what that's all about. So, but we still have one more terrific presenter, so let's get to um, Susan. Uh, Duplessis is the program director of the South Carolina Arts Commission. Susan has a wide range of experience in creative place-based work, so she might even talk about placemaking and what that means. Um, and she and in co-directing several significant partnerships, including the four-state Gullah Geechee. I hope I've gotten that uh, correct, and she will correct me um, as soon as I finish my introduction. The Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, South Carolina's Rural Promise Zone, and the Riley Institute at Furman University. Susan will share highlights from a pilot project, The Art of Community, Rural SC, which is part of the South Carolina Promise Zone Initiative uh, that was mentioned uh, by, I think, Lori just a minute ago. So welcome, Susan, and go ahead. Thanks so much, Fran, and I'd like to add my thanks to Orton for including the South Carolina Arts Commission um, in this presentation today. I'm already learning so much from the other presenters and um, really excited to just be part of the conversation. Um, in fact, the word learning is really what our entire initiative is about, the Art of Community Rural SC. It's a new framework for how a state arts commission, ours in South Carolina, is working in community and specifically in uh, the realm of community development. It's always been one of our priority areas, but we typically have come at it from the basis of our um, infrastructure that was already in place in small rural communities and large metro areas. In this case, we looked at the opportunity that um, came with the designation of the Rural Promise Zone as Lori said, um, Kentucky was the first rural promise zone, and then in April of 2015, uh, the South Carolina Arts Commission, I mean, the South Carolina Promise Zone was designated. And so let's see if I can forward. Uh, okay. Whoops. So in this new partnership, the South Carolina Arts Commission looked at the opportunity to become an official partner with the Promise Zone, and that meant that we were actually in on the ground floor 
um, working with through the strategic planning um, that happened over uh, eight different days in the region. You see the map of South Carolina there, the section that's colored green. These are the six counties that we're working specifically in, in with this new initiative. And so through listening and that experience, um, listening to local leaders, people from throughout the six counties talk about issues that they were facing, um, we created a new framework, and we've heard the framework earlier, uh, framework term, but we've created a framework for learning, listening, and sharing, and we're doing it in, with considerations of place, culture, and creativity. And so part of what we've done is we've seized an opportunity to work differently, and it's based on partnership. It's also asset-based. And we're looking at how we build capacity in an area that uh, whose economy was really changed dramatically by the construction of Interstate 95 um, about 40 or so years ago. And these small communities are still reeling from um, the changes that came with that, um, with the construction of that highway. Um, ultimately, we are looking at this as a way to build new relationships and, and really feel like that is the basis for, um, for the work that we're doing and is really leading to some amazing new um, changes and connections that, um, that will continue. This is the first year of a three-year project, and so uh, we've just finished the first year. And so to give you a little more context about um, about our state and this part of the state. Um, South Carolina, of course, it sits between North Carolina and Georgia, and the um, six counties we're working in uh, have a population of just over 90,000 people and have seen a lot of outflow of people rather than inflow of people. Um, the unemployment rate is um, almost 15% on average. And so it's an area like many of those that, that Lori and Sarah described, um, you know, that um, struggle with, with all the things that come when you have an area that um, is not prospering economically. Uh, what's been exciting about the creation of this framework, and I'll tell you more about the specifics of it, is that it's positioned the State Arts Commission, we are a state agency, um, to work differently and to work at a grassroots level with individuals. And so uh, we built this program on top of long work that we've done in rural communities. This certainly is not anything new. It's just coming at it a little bit differently. And so one of the big, um, uh, big things that we did, I think, that really helped us was participating in that regional strategic planning and helped us listen and learn and hear from the get-go um, how organizations and people were feeling about their communities. So, Sorry. Okay. So one of the first parts of this framework was that we identified local champions. We call them mavens. So uh, one from each of the six counties that, that we're working in. And we ask each of them to identify local teams, up to six people from their local community, uh, to join us in this effort. And we began with talking about um, local stories of place and helping people remember what it was about the place that they lived, that they loved. And we also uh, didn't forget that there are challenges in the places that we're working in and asked them to also think about what were the challenges but not to get stuck there, because one of the things that I learned in participating in the strategic planning process for the six counties was that often when you're in a place who is continually told what you don't have, you forget what you do have. And so that's been one of the um, places of origin that we start at, is remembering what we do have and building from that. We were, we've done a series of regional meetings where we convene, we come together, we listen, we learn. Um, we've asked our, um, each of our teams to develop a project that will identify a local challenge, a local community development challenge, and then 
address that using arts and culture at, at least as one of the primary ingredients in how you address that. Um, we've done that with the incentive of a $1,000 grant, which we know is a small amount of money, and we look at that as a way to um, hopefully that they'll use that as a way to leverage more, um, more funding to support their local project. So thank you. The um, third part of this framework is that we have uh, created an advisory committee that is na from national um, to statewide. We've brought together leaders, and we have, um, you see pictured here, the dean of the branch of the University of South Carolina that's in that region, and we also um, are co-chaired by Bob Reeder, who's with Rural List. We have a number of other people on our um, team, and we're having a series of advisory calls where we talk about what's happening um, in our region, but also get ideas from them nationally um, to hear what other resources we could be bringing to the table. One of the important things, and I just want to say a special thanks to Lori uh, from Kentucky, who joined us for our field trip to Kentucky um, back in June. And I can't say um, enough about how important that trip was for our group. We took our six mavens out of South Carolina. We went to the other rural promise zone to learn from them, to hear how they tell the story of their places and their successes. And we brought that back, and that's really been um, central to our conversations for going forward. So it helped to um, create a new framework for thinking and also to just get us out of our mindsets that we were, that we were in. So that um, was really, really important. We visited also Whitesburg, Kentucky, and um, spent the day at Apple Shop, which is renowned and was really a, a wonderful thing. One of the important things, though, that happened as a result of this field trip was that spending three days in a van with each other um, we really bonded. And so this group that didn't know each other before, the Six Mavens, um, now are fast friends, and the bonding that happened through that was incredible. So not only did we make a great connection with Kentucky and learn from them, but our group really um, came together in an important way. So ultimately, we've created a new formula, but um, I like to think that we're not being formulaic at the same time. Um, so we asked each of our groups to design a project that would address a community challenge, and that might be around public safety, health, housing, transportation, economic development, workforce, education, or another challenge that they identified. And part of this exercise was to get people um, at the table thinking about how they tell a story in a compelling way, what makes it urgent, what's the context. And are there more people that care about that challenge than just that community? How does it fit into a larger context? So you see there we've got arts and culture plus the community challenges, plus place, plus assets, plus leadership, which we're also developing through uh, the identification of our mavens and their team members. We've incentivized it with a $1,000 grant, but looking for other funds to support it. And then, of course, brought the um, technical assistance from the Arts Commission and funding from USDA, which we're so grateful for. And that's the um, project that we call the Art of Community Rural SC. So to wrap up, we're in the first of three years of this. And we're really excited. Already at the end of this year, we're seeing that new skills are being developed in our rural area. Um, leadership is blossoming, we're sharing culture, we're sharing successes, we're addressing challenges that um, many of our rural communities um, share, and so we're learning from each other in that way. And, um, and, and the regionalism that's coming from this is just fantastic. These groups are starting to meet on their own without the Arts Commission being the one pushing it. And in fact, they've even um, decided that they're going to do um, something called the Voice of Promise. And so um, sort of taken after the, um, the Voice television show, they'll be doing a regional competition. And so this is a whole other piece that's happening um, as a result of this. So um, I'll, I'll leave it All there. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Susan. Um, some, some great things on the ground, and clearly um, a lot of support for cooperation. Just to be, um, we aren't going to let you go quite yet, because Michael from Minnesota has asked, what are the pros and cons of cooperation? Are there any downsides of cooperation? And, and one of the others of you might have this, but Susan, do, do you see any downside of working towards this cooperation that, that you've worked so hard at? I don't, I don't see a downside at all. I think that we, um, what we're learning in, in keeping this framework of learning um, central is that in order to cooperate with another entity or another community, you have to listen and you have to suspend your own um, desire for a moment to be able to hear what others are facing. And I think within that frame, then you're able to hear and find um, those areas where there's overlap. So it's just okay. a new skill set, I believe. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll try to get through a few quick questions. We uh, don't have a lot of time, but um, another question came in from Jen from uh, Vermont. And she says, within uh, our communities and within uh, the sector, there is increasing divisiveness. It is critical that as organizations with a bird's eye view of all the local work happening, that we, I think, kind of at a statewide or regional, um, region-wide uh, perspective, provide resources and a space and support to learn and work and debate together well and civilly. People will come to that more easily, she says, when real actionable results come out of that work. The actionable results will be more effective and powerful when they arrive from a sense of alignment versus compromise. So she's really interested in how this work supports that intention of trying to, you know, alignment versus compromise. I'm wondering, Sarah, if you'd, if you'd like to tackle that a little bit. Um, are you seeing that, that results um, help with that alignment? Is, how do you get to alignment beyond just compromise? Or do you feel that there is, um, it, it, there is a tension between those two? Um, no, actually, I, I think, um, and I think uh, one of the other presenters kind of alluded to this, um, there's not going to be, um, there's always going to be a little bit of um, competition and um, uh, a little bit of working together, and actually some of our um, project participants have alluded to that, that um, where it makes sense to work together, and trails being the, the obvious example, they are more than happy to um, line up behind each other. When it comes to things like, you know, um, what business is going to locate where, there's still a little bit of um, healthy competition and compromise. But um, I, I think that all of our communities recognize that there are places where um, we can easily align. And um, if we get to the point where we're competing with each other for businesses, that's a win. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if that makes sense, but um, I, I, I don't think it's a, a one or the other kind of deal. Okay, thank you. We have a Burton from South Carolina um, wants, um, and I'm going to, Laura, I'm going to go after you since you've dealt with 54 counties and pulling them together. Um, she uh, hopes that someone will describe an internet strategy, uh, planned use of digital media and related networking tools. I, I think she's talking about, you know, kind of how does, can technology be used to communicate among all those stakeholders um, and or to share out information to the larger community. Lori, how, how, do you, how do you keep um, 54 counties kind of on the same page? Well, well, it's really hard and it doesn't always happen. Um, I think one of the things that we do is uh, try to use as much um, electronic information as possible, so creating our guidebooks, that sort of thing, making sure they're available electronically. You know, but one of the issues that we have to deal with um, in eastern Kentucky is that there's not broadband across the entire area. It's something that's being worked on right mm. now. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not always possible for people to um, communicate uh, as fast as people in the other parts of the state might be. Um, you know, even things like phone calls. Um, I have board members who have to leave their home and drive into town so that they can get cell phone access. So, you know, it's hard. So we try a variety of, of different ways. Sometimes it just plain won't work to use, um, you know, electronic media, and so we go back to printing copies. But we also use a lot of social media because, you know, it's quick mm -hmm. little bites, and 
people can get those links or whatever and, and tie into other things quickly. Great. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another question is, is about funding, and, and Brett, I'm going to reach out to you for this. Any guidance about how funders can encourage um, and or how they can evaluate applications from collaborative municipal entities? So I guess this person is getting at if municipal entities want to collaborate and they um, they aren't from Michigan where, where there are incentives, um, how can they encourage or evaluate um, applications? Brett, do you have some thoughts on, on funding? Yeah, you know, just, just briefly. Yeah, certainly. I think, you know, we've definitely at the federal level seen uh, an emphasis on regionalism and collaboration, and we've certainly seen that from, from two projects that were uh, mentioned today, and, and Sarah talking about uh, the work to emerge from their Sustainable Communities Initiative um, work up in Michigan, and then certainly the, the Promise Zones uh, efforts as well. So I think at the federal level, there's a real appreciation uh, for for working together uh, regionally, and those communities coming together and, and, and demonstrating that. And in some ways, you know, that's actually uh, you know a prerequisite in some of these applications. Um, so it's one example of the Economic Development Administration. Uh, which is part of the uh, Department of Commerce, has, has recently put a, a set aside uh, for projects that do have that regional element. So they're actually looking specifically at those those elements. And uh, if anyone has any questions about that afterwards, I could certainly follow up uh, on some, some infrastructure projects there too. But I think over the past eight years in the Obama administration, we've certainly seen a real focus on, on working together regionally and, and leveraging uh, those assets. And, and that's um, in, in both uh, large metros, but also in smaller places, where as we talked about, it's really critical that these towns can, can really show of the work that they're doing uh, in a host of sectors. You know, we talked about tourism or, or manufacturing or outdoor recreation, um, small towns working together, I think really makes you more competitive for some of these these uh, projects um, that are out there. Great. Thank you, Brett. Um, so good, good luck. Good luck with everybody on that. Uh, another question came in from Barbara in South Carolina. She wants, she asks, how can deliberative dialogue on difficult social problems and rural design and development be combined. So I'm looking at uh, probably either Susan or Lori, who really work with Arts Council. Um, are there projects where really difficult social problems uh, can be worked on through rural design and development? Uh, Susan, want to take that quickly, or sure. Lori, you can try it. I'm in. I would just say that our example that we're doing through the Art of Community Rural SC is one in which we're getting to know each other first. And so, and then we are working on rural design because each one of our teams are working on a, a design project for their community. And so uh, the nature of what we've created, which is to know people better, to actually have relationships with one another um, where there are issues of poverty and race relations. Um, if you look at our pictures, you'll see that we're racially a very diverse group. We have gotten to know each other. We're friends. We are beyond stereotypes, and I think that's the first step mm. in, uh, in doing this. Thank you. Um, this Go is ahead. Gloria. I yeah, would Laura. just add to that that one of the things that um, we really look at in that area is accessibility, and I don't just mean physical accessibility, but you know, our, um, does everybody feel welcome? Does everybody feel um, uh, encouraged and enabled to come and be part of the picture? And I think what Susan was discussing in terms of setting up those relationships is one of the key factors. But um, we actually have a, a grant program that deals with accessibility in various areas. And I think, um, you know, just kind of starting that dialogue certainly helps. Terrific. We are just about out of time, um, so I want you all to think of, you know, kind of what your last comments would be for people working on uh, regional collaboration. Uh, Carol does come in, though, with a recommendation about resources that, uh, that act as a how-to manual. Um, as a jumping off point for growing arts in the region. So if you have a recommendation of kind of how-to manuals for either regional uh, collaborating growing arts in a region, uh, why don't you add those to your closing statements? Uh, so we're going to go back to Brett. Um, just a quick sum up of uh, a, a last uh, piece of advice for our listeners. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks again for, for having me on and 
So this will probably not come as a surprise, but you know, I'd really encourage everyone to, to reach out and connect uh, with their, their local regional development organization, you know, if you haven't done so already. Uh, you know, these folks have a host of expertise and relationships and, and technical know-how um, that can serve small communities and towns with, with a whole host of areas, such as GIS mapping, you know, grant writing, and staff support. So there's certainly conveners and networkers uh, that can help build a, a regional coalition. So I encourage you to engage them uh, with your work, no matter what field you're working in. Uh, and again, if you're unsure which uh, RDO serves your region, you know, please reach out to me and be in touch. But, but best of luck to all of you, and, and thanks again for tuning in. All right, Brett, thank you so much. And Sarah Lucas, uh, your final thoughts. Um, I guess I'd, I'd just um, encourage people to um, take the first step and get people in the same room together. Uh, I think we, we mentioned a few times during the course of the presentation how a lack of capacity and resources is one of the biggest challenges we have in implementing regionalism. And um, recognizing that and understanding that our communities also recognize that. They're um, understaffed and overworked and don't have um, a lot of opportunities to um, educate themselves on a lot of issues. So if there's a way you can provide that education and capacity building to communities, they will come. And I think in the process of learning about some of the development issues in their communities, they'll recognize commonalities with their neighbors and things kind of build from there. And that's been one of the great successes of our initiative is that people are so willing to continue to talk and to continue to work together in a group in part to access that educational opportunity. Mm, terrific. Great reminder. Uh, Lori Meadows, go ahead. Yes. Um, I'd just like to reiterate one of the things I said earlier is that it takes time and don't get frustrated if things don't happen immediately because, you know, oftentimes it takes back and forth in, in working on projects together and then, you know, then something will click. So this isn't a fast process. Um, the other thing is to, you know, when you're talking about change within a community or development within a community, to make sure that it is a change that the gr group of people living and working in that community actually want to see. And, you know, it's not led by just a, a very small group of people, and it doesn't really reflect the entire community because that is almost a um, sure chance for failure. So that um, overall collaboration, uh, creating relationships and bringing people together, I think is critical. Thank you, Lori. And Susan Duplessis, um, your, your last thoughts and advice to our audience from South Carolina. Thanks so much, and I just want to concur with what Lori just said about the time factor. It is long work, and um, just really, really resonate with that. The other thing I wanted to add is just how rewarding and rich this work is working in community in this way, and especially when you use arts and culture as a kind of binder. Um, I think it creates a freshness um, in a process that's iterative. And the other thing that I think has been important for the South Carolina Arts Commission in this approach is we've gone into it knowing that we don't know. We have not gone into this work with a prescription for what people should do or what we think they should do. It really has been a learning process that's mutual and listening, and so I think that has made it exciting. It feels creative, and um, at the same time, by adding the community challenge and keeping um, keeping that out there is, is something that we're not ignoring it. it. It makes, in a way, it makes the arts, the aspect of arts and culture even more relevant um, in communities, and it certainly changes the relevance of the work of a state arts commission in a community. Well, I want to thank you all. Um, thanks to Brett, to Sarah, to Lori, uh, to Susan for sharing your stories and your wealth of knowledge. Um, thank you all for, for being on board today. It was, it was really terrific. And I see that some of you are answering some of these questions. We didn't get to all of them, but um, before I, I just sum up, um, again, thank you to Brett, Sarah, Laura, and Susan. Thank you. Thank all you. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and many thanks to all of you across the U.S. For, and, and, and well beyond for joining us today. I'd also like to thank uh, CIRD, the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, and the Orton Family Foundation and their folks who run the back room so well and who make these sessions possible. Please take a moment to fill out the survey on the Adobe Connect page.
page. We also recommend uh, checking out the CERD website at rural-design.org and check out new features that they have there, including a searchable resource library. I also want to send out a shout out for the Rural Creative Placemaking Summit that took place in October. Um, it was a dynamic summit and the first of its kind uh, funded by the NEA. Uh, there's a link to an article on the event that is on your screen and that will help that person who also asked about placemaking. So if you want to know more about placemaking, that would be a, a great thing to check out. Um, somebody also asked about uh, getting some of these slides. There is a recording of this webinar that will be sent around to all of you participants um, and it will be posted on our website www.orton.org uh, which is certainly another cool site to uh, peruse. We hope you join us in January, and thank you, Ashley. I'm sorry I've gone, I've gone a little over time. I usually try to stay within the hour, but we're, we're just about finished. We hope you join us in January when the Orton Family Foundation partners with the International City and County Management Association, or ICMA, in a call on a better way to do business through engagement. All the best to all of you and your communities. Um, I hope you um, have enjoyed this and maybe check in on some of the questions and answers that are up there on the board before we close down today. Thanks to you all. See you next year. Bye-bye.